Hello, hello and welcome. I'm Ann Leonard, Manton Curator of Prince Drawings and Photographs at the Clark Art Institute, and I'm very pleased to be introducing our newest exhibition, Durer and After, which opens on Saturday. So many colleagues throughout the museum helped to bring this show to fruition. For the sake of time, I can only thank them collectively here, though I appreciate them all quite individually. I want to make special mention of MA intern Yuifeng Wu, who assisted with the research. I'm also grateful to Armin Kunz of CG Burner in New York, who spent two days in the print room with me in the depths of the pandemic winter, looking closely at the works slated for exhibition and sharing his tremendous knowledge. Finally, let me express deepest gratitude to Denise Littlefield Sobel, who generously supported the exhibition. During tonight's lecture, you are welcome to submit questions at any time through the Q&A function on Zoom or in the comments section if you're following on Facebook Live. At the end, I will answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, so we all know the expression, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. It may come to mind as consolation while we half grumble about some person who has just gone in for our same clothing style, haircut, or car, but it is no less true in the visual arts. Judging by the number of his imitators, Albert Dürer, who was born in Nuremberg in 1471, is one of the most flattered printmakers in the history of art. What I'm showing you on this slide is copies after Durer's iconic engraving of Adam and Eve dated 1504 with the original at upper left. And, and these are just the ones that happen to be in the Clark collection. There are many, many more. <clears throat> Excuse me. This pattern of imitation began early in Durer's career at the beginning of his fame, and it has never really stopped. Even today, printmakers look to Durer as a resource for any sort of technical challenge that might arise in historical methods of printmaking. For he seemed to have overcome every single one. His woodcuts are so finely incised as to appear to defy the material properties of wood. As you can see on the screen, the enlarged detail in the center column shows an area of about one square inch while his mature engravings boggle the mind with their linear sophistication and densely layered symbolism. His range of subject matter spanned the sacred and the secular, the historic and the contemporary, the animal and plant kingdoms. And of course, Durer was a supremely self-assured, self-aware artist whose portraits alone suggest that his place in the grand art historical narrative was nothing short of inevitable. To wit, he executed the drawn self-portrait on the left at age 13. The two painted self-portraits date from his late 20s. Durer is a foundational figure in Western art whose achievement was wondrous, prodigious, almost unaccountable. But from the standpoint of this exhibition and lecture, his major breakthrough was to elevate the cultural status of prints. We need to remind ourselves that in its early years, printmaking in the West was a utilitarian means of exchanging visual information. Well into the 15th century, it still had not attained anything like the status of a collectible art form. That meant that most prints were treated as ephemeral scraps valued only for their usefulness and considered disposable thereafter. Judging by the ones that have survived, such as playing cards and devotional prints, they served a practical purpose until they wore out. There was little thought of preserving them for their artistic qualities. This change in appreciation came about in Durer's lifetime and largely as a response to his own work. Durer's prints contributed to his renown in two ways. Just like his paintings, by their own merits, the woodcuts, engravings, and etchings attracted attention to his extraordinary talent. But unlike the paintings, which relatively few people had the opportunity to see, 
Durer's prints could be issued in great numbers and circulated widely, and thus they were active vectors in spreading his fame, dare one say, like a viral YouTube video today. In another phenomenon we're familiar with, even counterfeit prints that circulated with his name or monogram attached did their part in helping build the brand. In this exhibition, Durer and After, you will find prints by the man himself and his imitators displayed in clusters in order to differentiate original from copy and to understand the reasons and motives for imitation. Now, of all artistic media, prints might seem the best suited to copying. By definition, they exist in multiple identical impressions. So what does it mean to say a copy of a print by Durer? Is he the creator or not? There is ambiguity here, which is why I will refer to copy after rather than copy of when an, another artist imitates his work. In fact, there are two senses to after in the title Durer and after. Nearly all the artists included in the exhibition did follow him, chronologically speaking. But the other sense of after is to do with authorship. It's not at all unusual for the person making a print, cutting the wood block or incising the metal plate to be separate from the person who designed it. In the early days of printmaking, when copies were a vector for visual communication, this wasn't so much of a problem. If you're reading a copy of instructions for assembling IKEA furniture, for example, you're not so worried about who made the original. But for prints that are recognized as works of art in their own right, the stakes for authorship change dramatically. Durer considered himself the creator of pictorial ideas, the likes of which were, in his own words, never before seen nor thought of by any other man. In popular perception, there's often a negative connotation to copying in Western art. Here, I'm not talking about the modern concept of appropriation art, so much as the pre-modern notion of the handmade copy. Viewed as perhaps okay for apprentices and artists in training, copying tends to be disparaged in mature makers, as if only someone lacking in originality would engage in such a practice. At one end of the creativity spectrum is the genius burning with inspiration, at the other, the banal mechanical copyist. This dichotomy is clearly culturally biased, for in many Asian art traditions, for instance, faithful copying is revered and carries greater prestige than newly conceived work. But it also leans on the modernist myth of this singular exceptional genius, itself severely outdated by now. Not just in East Asia, but in the Byzantine Empire and elsewhere in the medieval West, meticulous fidelity to a prototype was considered an exalted for form of artistic achievement. And even in the print workshops of Durer's day, there was no premium placed on original creations. Quite the opposite. Professional engravers and block cutters were more richly rewarded for technically perfect copies after leading artists than for compositions of their own invention. The many efforts over the centuries to recreate Durer's work prove the high regard in which the originals were held, but copies also challenge the idea of singular authorship. Without the competition from his imitators, Durer might never have honed the notions of intellectual property that today make him appear even more as a thoroughly modern figure. Now, as proof that authorship can be a complicated issue, we have only to look at this printed portrait of Durer on the left, where a lengthy Latin inscription accounts for the string of artists involved. The maker of the print, Lucas Killian, has reproduced a painted portrait by Hans Rottenhammer, which is now lost. That portrait, in turn, derived from a Durer painting, The Feast of the Rose Garlands, commissioned by German merchants for a church in Venice, um, although the painting is now in Prague. In the painting, the distinguished company surrounding the Madonna includes ecclesiastical power headed by the Pope on the left, 
On the right, the worldly power of the king, later emperor Maximilian I, who is receiving the Virgin's blessing. But who is over here standing in the distance against the tree? That is Durer himself. I've put a green box around him. The artist has slyly inserted his own likeness and a paper bearing this, uh, his own signature, monogram, and date of the work, 1506. Furthermore, his luxurious fur-lined cloak recalls the one he was wearing in the self-portrait we saw earlier of 1500. It's as if he just shifted the frontal portrait to a three-quarter view for the later painting. Durer certainly knew a thing or two about self-referentiality. Now, even in prints with a less complicated string of authorship, inscriptions can help sort out the different roles. In this printed copy by Adam von Barch after a Durer drawing, the DEL period stands for the Latin delineavit, or he drew it, while SC period stands for the Latin sculpsit, he carved it. This tells us that Durer created the design while Barch executed the printed version. Elsewhere, these same roles are distinguished by INV period for he invented it and FEC period for he made it. Now, there are two ways to make a copy of a print. The easier, easier way is to reprint from an existing matrix, if you can get your hands on one. A matrix is simply the surface from which a print is made. In Durer's time, this was usually a woodblock or, as shown on the screen, a metal plate. The problem is that it is not at all easy to get your hands on an original matrix from Durer's time. They are exceptionally rare. Only one of his own metal plates has survived. Woodblocks uh, degraded with use uh, or fell victim to termites or worm. Metal plates were frequently melted down for more urgent needs like war or currency. The Dura woodblock on the screen survives in the Morgan Library in New York. It's a design for the coat of arms of Michael Behaim dated about 1520. Glued to the back of it is a letter from the artist to his client, which I want to read to you as it reveals again Durer's supreme self-confidence as an artist. Quote, Dear Herr Michel Behaim, I am sending you the coat of arms again. Please let it be as it is. No one could improve it because it was done artistically and with care. Those who see it and who understand such matters will tell you so. If the leaf work on the helmet were curled back, it would hide the braid. Your humble servant, Albrecht Durer, end quote. And I know you all will be questioning Durer's use of the word humble in the closing. The more common way of copying a print and the one explored in this exhibition is using an existing impression to trace and carve a new matrix. That is exactly what happened with this extremely rare 15th century copper plate engraved by Israel van Mechenem in the Clark's collection and on view in the exhibition. The design has been traced from an impression of Durer's enigmatic print for nude women and engraved directly onto a new plate. Because of the phenomenon of reversal in printmaking, the orientation is therefore flipped in van Mechenem's copy. Other artists, as we will see, choose to correct for this by drawing the design on the new matrix in reverse. This work dates from the end of Van Mechenem's career, and it's rather touching to think of the older artist, actually 25 years older, producing this tribute when Durer's rise was just beginning. As with Van Mechenem's copies of works by other artists, this one bears his own signature. You can see it at the bottom. It's always a choice on the part of the copying artist whether to keep the original artist's signature, burnish it away, and or add one's own. And the exhibition includes examples of all three situations. Depending on the circumstance, there may be an advantage to claiming authorship, as we'll see in just a moment, a career building uh, gesture <laughs> by a young, young Virix to advertise his technical ability. Or conversely, there may be an advantage to sowing confusion around authorship. 
When Jan Gierks executed this meticulous copy of Durer's Adam and Eve at the age of just 16, um, that's the copy on the left, he added his name under Durer's in a way that clearly distinguishes his work as printmaker from that of the inventor. Many years later, he engraved a copy of Durer's Melancholia I and left the AD monogram intact, quite discreet at the lower right, though I doubt you can see it on your screen. It's in the shadow of that step that uh, Melancholia is, is seated on. In small type in the lower margin, Virix indicated his name and the date of the copy. Johann Virix, Vekit, Anno 1602. The placement of this inscription, however, offers a temptation to unscrupulous dealers who may trim the signature below the line in an effort to pass off this print as Durer's autograph work, and which is of course valued more highly. For any given print, there can exist at least three kinds of impressions based on their distance from the original artist's hand and intent. First, so-called autograph impressions produced by the artist or under his direct supervision. The second category is lifetime impressions printed before the artist's date of death, but by, uh, but by other actors. Uh, this includes both legitimate and pirated versions. And the third category is posthumous impressions. All of these though come from a printing matrix made by the artist's own hand. If an authentic Durer matrix turned up today and I inked and printed it, I would have a posthumous impression. But anytime the link with the original woodblock or copper plate is broken, we're in the realm of copy after. So how do we know what we are looking at? There are several factors to consider in judging when a print was made and by whom. We can start with wear or degradation of the matrix. If we compare these two St. Eustaces by Durer, we'll quickly see that one is an exquisite lifetime impression, while the other is a very late one from a worn copper plate. In such a magnificently detailed print as this, the largest engraving Durer ever made, there are countless points of comparison, from the hunter's costume worn by St. Eustace to the crucifix between the stag's antlers, to the impeccably drawn team of dogs, the mountainous landscape, and the swans, which I hope you can see, complete with their engraved reflections visible in the lake. And just in general, throughout the later impression, the forms have lost their three-dimensionality. Another factor to notice is reversal. As we saw earlier in the Van Mechenem copy, the shift in orientation shows that it cannot have been printed from the original matrix. And then a further clue to the authorship and dating of a print is the paper it's printed on. This Durer profile portrait of Durer, uh, the, the work of Erhard Schoen, got reprised plenty of times after his death. And the copy you see at right is printed actually on a paper that wasn't manufactured until centuries later. Watermarks in the paper can further clarify dating and origin. But this pair is interesting for another reason too. You'll notice that the cartouche in the left, uh, in the left hand corner, which is empty in the original portrait, contains a monogram in the copy no doubt to suggest out of either deceit or ignorance that the image is a juror self-portrait, but we know that it is actually based on a posthumous metal, which I'm showing you here. Durer's famous monogram was the basis for what is considered the first counterfeit lawsuit in the history of art which arose on his second trip to Venice. Interestingly, Durer's first use of that monogram is around 18, uh, sorry, 1495, right after his first trip to Venice, he'd been actually fleeing a plague as it happens. By the time of his second trip in 1505, he was a major figure on both sides of the Alps. You remember he received that big commission for a feast of the rose garlands and altarpiece for a Venetian church. And he felt full confidence in his abilities, even up against the greatest of Italian artists. 
he brought along with him a set of prints narrating the life of the Virgin Mary, which were showpieces for his virtuosic technique in the unforgiving woodcut medium. The Italian artist Marcantonio Raimondi, intrigued, cannily decided to turn even more profit from these admired works by making engraved copies. Engravings were valued more highly than the humble woodcut, and yet still selling them as Durer's, retaining the AD monogram. At this, Durer cried foul. In the printed colophon, he issued a warning, and I'll read it to you. Woe to thee, fraudster and thief of someone else's labors and invention. Let thou not even think of laying thy impertinent hands on this work. For let me tell thee that Maximilian, the most glorious emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, granted us the privilege that no one might print copies of these pictures and that no such prints might be sold within the imperial domains. But should thou still transgress, whether out of disregard or criminal avarice, be assured that after confiscation of thy property, the severest penalties shall follow. Fighting words. But what is the imperial privilege for Maximilian to which Durer refers? Traditionally, royal or papal privileges had protected artists' artistic ideas as the sole property of their creators, almost like an early form of copyright. But this protection could only go so far. It held less sway in Southern Europe. And after all, Marc Antonio could always say that he had made, sculpts it, the design on the metal plate. And in that sense, the image was his. Another of Marc Antonio's engravings after the life of the Virgin suggests an apparent compromise in which copies after Durer's images were acceptable if they were acknowledged as such with Marc Antonio's initials clearly visible. You can see them right there. Durer's Little Passion series, printed and reprinted countless times, looks back to earlier practices and traditions of private devotion, where what was represented in the image counted more than who had made it. Here, the copyist is anonymous. You'll notice that one of these pairs of copies is reversed and the other is not, uh, but this does not seem to have mattered. What we begin to see in Durer's era and immediately after is a more entrepreneurial climate for print publishing. With print collecting on the rise, particularly in the burger and merchant classes, the question was, where could a profit be made? It was all a matter of keeping up with demand. Durer's Great Triumphal Chariot series, part of an enormous propaganda project for the Emperor Maximilian, was printed in 17 different editions in the 16th century alone. Hans Goldenmund, a book dealer and printer in Nuremberg, saw his chance, made a duplicate set of woodblocks, which were still being printed 50 years after his death. And it is extraordinary to imagine the effort involved in creating these very large scale uh, woodblocks of which there were there are eight. Durer's skills were so great that he is sometimes seen as having an inhibiting effect on printmaking in Germany after his death. A generation of so-called little masters or Kleinemeister veered away from Durer's large engraving practice and tended to make prints at extremely modest scale as if to avoid any accusation of hubris. It's therefore somewhat unusual to come across a copy that has been made larger than the original, such as Hieronymus Hopfer's copy of the peasant couple dancing. It's not so much a line for line imitation as a creative interpretation with landscape elements added in. But it's uh, Durer's three Meistersticke, the so-called master engravings from 15, 13, and 14, which have always been particularly ripe for reinterpretation because of their dense layers of meaning. This pattern has continued into the 20th and 21st centuries. And we'll see in the following examples how later artists capitalized on the high recognition value of Durer's images to convey a new significance. Let's begin with St. Jerome, the church father who translated scripture from Hebrew into Latin. 
Durer revered Jerome for his uh, intellectual achievements and created an extremely sensitive image of the scholar in his study. Light streams through the leaded windows, illuminating the desk where the saint is working. The, the lion he tamed by removing a thorn from its paw lies peacefully, if incongruously, at his feet. Now let's look at the reverse square copy by Wolfgang Stuber, who gives Jerome the features of Protestant reformer Martin Luther. While it makes sense to link Jerome and Luther, two great translators of the Bible, the inscription at the bottom packs a strong anti-papal message that is foreign to Durer's original image. Referring to Martin Luther, it says, O Pope, living I have been your plague, dying I shall be your death. Durer's personification of melancholy, meanwhile, spoke powerfully to artists and writers of the Romantic period and afterward. In it, Durer recast melancholy not as a disease, as it had been usually portrayed in medical treatises, but as a driver of creative activity. In the early 20th century, James McBay included a sketch of Melancholia I in his portrait drawing of the Scottish poet James Thompson. With this allusion to Durer's arguably most famous print, McBay conveys the morose temperament of the man who has been called the most bleakly pessimistic of the Victorian poets. And speaking of bleakly pessimistic, we won't stay long. Here is French artist Maurice Newmont's take on Night, Death, and the Devil. At the height of World War I, he used an Uber German print to deliver a scathing anti German propaganda message. The knight is reimagined as an imperial army general, and the devil wears a gas mask as they trample suffering victims underfoot. And then bringing us right up to the present, or 2016 anyway, Parker Ito is a contemporary artist who has reinterpreted all three Meistersticke by putting himself at the center of each composition. Taking on the guises of Melancholia, the Knight, and St. Jerome in turn, Ito introduces color and plenty of saucy pop cultural references along the way. In a sense, these in-jokes take us back to the fascination Durer's prints held for their first generation of collectors in the spirit of mysterious allegories intended to be deciphered by an educated public. Cracking the code of meaning was, and still is, a subversive act. To conclude, I'd like to say a word about how the Clark came by its abundance of Durer material. Very precisely, we have 293 prints by him and 186 copies, making up more than 10% of the entire print collection. But German art did not figure prominently in Sterling and Francine Clark's founding gift, apart from this extraordinary drawing that Durer made in 1521, called Sketches of Landscapes and Animals, which Sterling had acquired in 1919. It was the Thomas Harris collection that really put the Clark on the map for Durer material. Well, who was Thomas Harris? Well, besides being a distinguished collector, Durer and Goya especially, connoisseur, and even an amateur printmaker in his own right, that's his self-portrait on the screen, he was a spy for MI5 who helped mislead the Germans as to the Allies' landing location on D-Day. That side of his activities would require another lecture entirely. But as a collector, Harris thrived on the competition for top quality impressions. On the mats of many of the works from him, one can still find recopied his notations comparing the examples he had managed to procure with impressions in other prominent collections. It was in 1968, after his death, that the Clark purchased 243 prints amassed by Harris, plus 30 more from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. But in the years preceding that, uh, meaning after 1955, 
a great number of copies after Durer had entered the Clark collection. Were those copies worth keeping once the marvelous Harris Trove arrived? Well, this exhibition contends that yes, absolutely, the copies still have great purpose and value, even in a collection that boasts first-rate originals. They offer a unique lens for assessing Durer's legacy. In 1975, students in the recently established Williams Graduate Program in the History of Art developed an exhibition called Durer Through Other Eyes. You might even spot it there on my bookshelf under the guidance of Julius Held, who had taught a related, a related seminar. Um, the catalog on my shelf uh, was published and it explores many of the same issues that are addressed in the present exhibition. As Professor Held wrote in the foreword, it is a fortunate circumstance that the Clark has a collection of spurious works as well as authentic ones. In his words, it is in an almost perverse way, one of the finest testimonials to the greatness of the artist and the constant esteem for his works. And as a final anecdote, it pleases me to say that the very first appointment in the Manton Study Center post COVID concerned Durer. It was booked last October by a local printmaker who told me that he had been experimenting with engraving technique for some time and was determined to learn more about Durer's secrets through close looking and close up photography. So clearly Durer still inspires. So thank you to all of you for tuning in. I hope the next time it will be in person. Um, and now we will take time for some questions. I'll stop sharing. And welcome any questions that you may have. So far, none. <laughs> But we can wait another minute in case people are typing. Here's a question about how many Dura prints the Clark has. So um, I it went by pretty quickly in, in my um, statement. So I have to check my own notes. I believe it's 293. Um, most came in from Harris. Uh, some were acquired later. Um, but again, plus the copies, this is fully a tenth of the, of the um, overall print collection, which is remarkable. And here's a question uh, about, while in Italy, did Durer use Italian paper for printmaking? Um, yes, he did. And that's exactly how often we know uh, where or when a print originated because it can be linked to certain paper types. Um, he did he did use Italian paper, he used Dutch paper, he used um, different kinds of paper that are, are often indicators either of when he um, immediately when he's making a work in a particular uh, place, uh, but he also brought stock back with him so it's not a foolproof method. You can't always date according to where he was um, by the kind of paper he's using, but it's, it is a very good clue. Um, a practical question, uh, is the exhibit at the Manton Center? Yes, it is. So for those of you who know the Clark and are nearby, I do hope you'll come by to see it um, from Saturday and through October 3rd. It is on the ground floor of the Manton building in the Thaw Gallery for Works on Paper. And that is our dedicated space for uh, Works on Paper exhibitions, often drawn the, from the collection, but not always. And I would love to see you See you there. Let's see. Uh, what was the inspiration for having this exhibit now? Um, great question. Um, there are a couple of Durer anniversaries for one thing. Uh, it, uh, so 2021 is indeed the 550th anniversary of his birth. 
Um, it is this year the 500th anniversary of his trip to the Netherlands, and there's a major show uh, a, a opening soon in London that uh, we are actually lending our drawing that I showed you to. So there's, um, but but I wouldn't say that was really the the reason for scheduling it. it it's ha lucky happenstance that we fall on these anniversaries. But the um, the collection, uh, of course, has a, has uh, been here for some time. It has been explored before the phenomenon of copying, but not in a while. And there is just something so fascinating and compelling, I think, for scholars and laymen, uh, everybody about the notion of counterfeit, fakes, forgeries, um, imitations, interpretations. It, it really poses a lot of very, very uh, live and contemporary questions about authorship and, and the rights to images and intellectual property. Um, it's just that the means are different, right? Uh, images travel a little slowly, a little more slowly in Durer's day, but the, the questions that come up uh, are, are the same ones that are coming up today uh, with virtual images. So uh, it seems always timely. Let's see. Uh, as far as to just to return to the Italian paper questions, uh, we have uh, an answer coming in. Thank you, Armin Kunz, uh, saying that the woodcuts after the so-called Leonardo knots are one of the very few prints that exist in early impressions anyway, printed on Italian paper. So there's, there's the expert, thank you. Here's, uh, there's some questions also coming in now about Durer's training, which is of course a fascinating question. Um, uh, talent, uh, prodigious talent is one thing, but uh, everyone needs training as well. So, um, and typically for the time uh, he he began as an apprentice, excuse me, as an apprentice in, in metalwork as well as drawing. So there was a very close connection uh, in the 15th century and early 16th between uh, etching and engraving Italian printmaking and things like metalwork, um, armor, uh, even jewelry. So he learned those arts all involving very, very fine manual technique. Um, and so he, he, he came up um, in, in that tradition and in that sense had a sort of traditional formation, but then just uh, uh, very quickly skyrocketed to a career that, uh, that none of his peers in, enjoyed on that level. Let's see. Here we have a question about um, scale. So you'll remember I, I mentioned the instance of a copy that was actually larger than the original. This was uh, the peasant couple dancing. The question being asked is, wouldn't the choice to make the copy smaller present further technical challenges for the copyists? Absolutely true. So the choice to make this copy larger in is in a sense, um, an easing of the challenge uh, for the copyist. Uh, there's, there's more room to roam, uh, room to play in on the matrix. Um, so it is not quite so exacting as a process. Uh, however, uh, working at scale is the more intuitive and the more natural, uh, especially if you're tracing uh, or copying from an, an existing impression. So there, um, but yes, there, making a copy smaller was often a way of actually showing off one's extreme virtuosity. Um, uh, if you, and, and in addition to the medium transfer that I mentioned from, uh, from woodcut to engraving or the reverse. Let's see. All right, here's one. Uh, do you think it would have been easier to copy a copper plate than a woodcut? Uh, so <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable trying either one, but uh, as a, for, for a printmaker, there's there's challenges to all media. The, the copper plate engraving uh, is, is, 
requires an incredible amount of, of labor. And again, is, is um, almost literally physical strength um, to, to push a, a, a burin through a copper plate. But woodcut is generally considered even more of, of a challenge. For, to, to, to achieve the same thickness of lines is impossible in a woodcutter, virtually so. And, um, and to do so also requires working with or against the grain of the wood. So there's a, you know, there's just a, a sort of material obstacle um, to making lines in all directions and, and that kind of thing. Um, the exception here is etching, which uh, Durer made relatively few etchings, although it, this was a, a form of intaglio um, printmaking that was uh, emerging in the period. Um, and some of the copyist dimensions, for, for example, worked nearly exclusively in etching to reproduce Durer's works. And that medium does have a relative ease of making compared to engraving and woodcut. And that was part of the appeal of it. Uh, it didn't mimic absolutely, but um, it, it was a much um, simpler um, process, more akin to actually to just drawing rather than sculpture. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, Yeah, some some of the questions are are coming in as just in the in the spirit of how did he do it, and there's always that amazement, and um, no one really has the answer to that. Uh, but let's see. But here's one uh, returning to the lawsuit of uh, Marc Antonio Raimondi. How did he respond to the legal decision in Durer's suit against his copying prints of the Virgin with the monogram? Um, you know, it, it was actually a rather favorable. A decision for him. It's usually viewed that way because the the real issue seemed to turn around the monogram, and as long as he was responsible in not um, basically forging Durer's monogram, he seemed to be in the clear. And he there there seems to have been some uh, agreement worked out where he could he could. He could make his copies um, with impunity, so to speak, uh, as long as he signed them properly. And he also gave credit to the various pub publishers he worked with. Um, and, it, and as a way of advancing his young career, it, it certainly was a, a, a good move uh, because he put himself in, in his daring and trying to put himself on a level with Durer, he was naturally compared with him. And it was a very profitable way to advertise his skill in the medium. All right, maybe. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end with a, uh, an interesting, and I, I I do apologize for not being able to get to all questions. Uh, we had a we had a, a, a very few at the beginning, and then a big glut now. So I fear we will run out of time before I'm able to answer them all. Um, but I the, the just stepping back, here's a question about uh, imitation as a form of flattery, a way to imitate or recreate a master. The question is whether there are examples in the exhibition where copying is actively subversive. Um, in other words, did contemporaries of Durer push against his popularity by repurposing his work? Um, I think we saw in the Meisterstück examples how meaning uh, was changed and meaning, meaning uh, became, or, or the prints themselves became a vehicle for a change in meaning. Uh, but the it's true too, though, that because these prints were were so well known and so strongly associated with Durer, that um, a challenge to them was would necessarily have um, put put the you know would have been sort of some act of hubris on the part of the copying artist. Um, there there was I think a lot of the question um, that comes up is. How, for example, from the point of view of the Reformation, for example, the Stuber print is quite interesting because there are certainly 
uh, there is certainly the argument that Durer's admiration for Jerome had to do with his translation of the Bible um, from Hebrew into Latin, and, his, and many see Luther as his heir in making the, the German Bible, which was then a vehicle for any lay person to, to read the Bible. So this was, of course, a, a major, major um, act of the Reformation. So, but Durer in, in portraying Jerome is not necessarily putting himself uh, on the sides of the, of the anti-papists. I mean, he, it's not known that he ever left the Catholic Church, for example. So uh, Stuber uh, extends, in a way, um, an illusion that uh, can be read into Durer's print and extends it to something much, much more extreme that was more of Stuber's own time and of his own sentiment. So there is always a kind of uh, intersection or, or a combination of artistic identities when one artist copies another. And that is really one of the most fascinating, uh, especially in the interpretive prints that are not simply line for line um, showcases of technical ability, but rather um, a, a reinterpretation that adds in that new sentiment and often from a completely different time, even up to our day, as we'll see with, with Parker Ito. So um, I'm gonna stop there. Um, it has really been a pleasure sharing Durer with you. I hope that you uh, enjoy the exhibition when you come and we have a whole slate of programming which you can find on our exhibition microsite on the Clark's main website in the exhibition section. So thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful evening.